Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Katherine Brookman, Associate Director, Knowledge Transfer and Exchange, and on behalf of Dr. Jack Callahan, Director of the Center of Research Expertise for the Prevention of Musculoskeletal Disorders, or CREAMSD as we are more commonly known, we'd like to thank you for joining us today for this free webinar. We are grateful to the Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development for our funding, which supports the delivery of these webinars and to our presenters who provide their expertise. We ask that you keep yourself muted for the duration of the webinar as a courtesy to the presenters and all participants. The format of today's webinar is as follows. The presentation will be given, after which time we will have 10 to 15 minutes for a question and answer period with our presenters. During the question and answer period, we ask that you type your questions into the chat box. The chat box can be pulled up on your screen by selecting the chat icon in the control panel that appears near the bottom of your screen. I will relay these questions to the presenters or a similar question should we have duplication in themes. Should you have a pressing question or issue such as a technology glitch that cannot wait until the end of the presentation, please type this into the chat box and we will do our best to address it right away. This webinar will be recorded with the recording being made available to you on our website along with the presenter's slides shortly after today's webinar. You will also be sent a link to an evaluation. Please fill out this evaluation as it will assist us in the future delivery of our webinars. Thank you so much for joining us today and remember to watch the CREAMSD website and the MSD prevention site for new resources and events. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters' authors today. Dr. Sadeem Korshi is a postdoctoral fellow in the Human Factors Engineering Lab at Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly Ryerson University. His research focuses on quantifying workload and its implications on quality using simulation technologies. Sadeem is a Toronto chapter leader for the Association of Canadian Ergonomists and the co-chair for the newly formed subcommittee of early career researchers and professionals at the International Ergonomics Association. Dr. Patrick Newman is the director of Actors Engineering Lab and a professor at the Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly Ryerson University. Patrick's research focuses on the design of work systems that are effective and sustainable from both human and technical perspectives. Areas of research interest include human factors and firm strategy, industrial system design processes, organizational design and change management, simulation and virtual performance modeling, and performance and exposure measurement. Now, it's my pleasure to hand over the webinar to you, Sadeem. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, just wanted to apologize in advance. Uh, if I start coughing all of a sudden, I seem to be having a mild throat infection. So uh, my apologies if I uh, start coughing like in the middle. I'll try to mute myself if that happens. Um, anywho, let's get started. Uh, for the next uh, while, I'm going to be talking about this uh, this research agenda that we have been working on um, at Toronto Metropolitan University for the past few moons. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge my research team, um, which is a combination of uh, professionals from uh, 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 Toronto Metropolitan's <clears throat> Mechanical and Industrial Engineering Department, uh, uh, Daphne Cockwell School of Nursing, uh, University Health Network, Conestoga College, and Runnymede uh, Healthcare Center as well. All right, I'll start with the big picture here. Um, we do know that uh, even pre-pandemic, the healthcare system was under an immense amount of pressure. Well, here are a couple of stats to sort of back up that claim. <clears throat> About millions and millions of dollars each year is spent on overtime absenteeism. And in addition to that, healthcare back in 2014 was number one in terms of lost time injuries. 
that includes WMSDs. Uh, so just to give you some perspective, healthcare was actually much more worse than the mining industry. So any, anytime you beat the mining industry, you're kind of sort of setting a new a new level for yourself. Um, uh, the Manitoba Nurses uh, Association actually interviewed uh, several nurses, and they found that 71% of the nurses that they've interviewed, they've experienced a burnout at least once in their life. Um, in addition to that, it was also found that nurses are um, are found to be crunching like 14 hours of work in a 12 hour shift. Okay. So <clears throat> um, before we proceed further, let's talk a little bit about nursing. Nurses are nurses constitute the biggest population of uh, care providers in the in the health care realm. Nursing work is complex. It's irregular. Um, it's uh, physically and psychosocially demanding. Okay? It is uh, less cyclic in comparison to manufacturing, but it's a uh, it's a lot more complex. And uh, we need uh, newer tools. The conventional, the traditional human factors tools uh, can't really measure uh, uh, the workload in a dynamic way. Right? So uh, what are we doing about it? So our conceptual model is that whatever the system design and policies that we have, um, it will constitute a workload. It will, it will create some kind of a workload. Depending on how good the workload, uh, how good or how bad the policies are, the workload will increase or would decrease. And of course, if workload increases, the well-being of the nurse or the healthcare provider would actually be impacted by it. Because you know, when you were when we're really overworked, uh, our mental health and physical health both kind of goes down the drain. In addition to that, um, a, a nurse or a healthcare provider, when they're working, and they're uh, 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 they're overworked, obviously care quality is sort of impacted uh, because they they might be rushing uh, uh, through tasks or they're just not be uh, or they're just not operating at 100% um, uh, level per se. So if you ever look at any, um, I guess, news channels, newspapers, uh, um, uh, or any other uh, trade papers for that matter, uh, everybody likes to focus on this aspect, uh, the care quality, that I spent so many hours in the ER, or uh, it took me so long just to sort of uh, uh, get, uh, get treated for my illness or whatever. Everybody focus on the care quality aspect. And oftentimes people think that they can't, uh, the reason for that is because of faulty individual, but which is not true. It's the overall impact of the system design that's actually uh, creating uh, bad quality that's being provided to the patients. So the problem is that we have the human, uh, the policies that are designed, um, they have the human factor is missing, of course. Um, policies designed without considering the, the worker in the system. All right, so we need better workload management tools for nurses, right? So what are we going to do about it? Um, simulations, specifically, uh, we feel discrete event simulation would be able to help uh, quantify this. So what is discrete event simulation? DES, uh, uh, in short, DES is a, is, a, is a common operational research technique uh, that can model complex workflows and processes in ways that can account for system variability and event probabilities. So <clears throat> uh, it's, a, it's a proven uh, tool and a useful tool in manufacturing settings, aerospace settings, and even uh, used in healthcare as well. Um, so we thought that, okay, let's, uh, let's try to uh, make use of it. Um, up till now, the uh, uh, majority of the DES work had, that has been done was always focused from the patient's perspective. Uh, in which patients were modeled uh, kind of like a product as uh, as product moves along in the manufacturing system. Uh, the novelty that we would have thought was uh, incorporating a human factors element, which is modeling from the perspective of nurses uh, to sort of quantify the workload. So our overall objective was, first of all, to create a, uh, a validated computerized simulation model that can quantify um, uh, that can quantify and test, of course, uh, the different organizational and technical design in terms of workload for nurses and quality of care. <clears throat> Specifically, uh, for, nur uh, for nurse workload, where we want to look at biomechanical, uh, biomechanical load, MST risk, 
mental workload, psychosocial implications, and of course, physical workload as well. In addition to that, we also wanted to examine the pandemic impacts as well. All right, so let's move on to the good stuff. Let's move on to the modeling uh, side of things. Uh, so we're not creating the model out of thin air. We are actually using anonymized patient care data. Um, we got that from a, from a, a downtown uh, Toronto Metropolitan Hospital, um, uh, Metropolitan Area Hospital um, um, for a period of one year. And we took the data from a med surgical unit. Uh, the reason why we took med surgical unit was because majority of the nurses, majority of the nursing population works in the in the medical surgical um, unit. In addition to that, we also took one year's worth of data because when we spoke to to our our, our knowledge users, they provide insight that care fluctuates throughout the year. Uh, in the summer, kind of like right now, you get uh, more uh, motorcycle accidents, unfortunately, and um, during winter time, you get more flu cases. Just as an example. So in addition to that, we also went inside the unit, the med surgical unit where we got the data from with our laser pointer and we mapped out the, we measured the entire unit and we created that on a software by the name of Microsoft Visio. It's a software used for civil engineering and architectural stuff. And uh, once we create the blueprint, the overall layout, we kind of imported that into our discrete event simulation model. In addition to that, we also held multiple focus groups to compute three different things, the walking patterns, so majority of the time, the nurses have to deliver care into patient beds, but oftentimes they have to uh, they have to take a secondary route, which is sometimes they have to go to the medication room or to the clean utility room to grab a gauze and whatnot, or sometimes to the dirty utility room to drop the soiled utility and whatnot. Um, in addition to that, we also had to come up with the brain of the simulation model, which was uh, deliver the highest priority care at the shortest distance. Um, and uh, in addition to that, we also quantified the different priority levels for, uh, for, for care tasks as well, uh, using focus groups. So just to sort of give, uh, uh, give you an overall layout of what the, what the unit kind of looked like, um, uh, this is where we have all the beds, all the utility uh, closets and rooms for, for that matter, and the nursing station at the center of the unit. Uh, so let me show you how the model actually works. So for instance, we have a care task that's coming in, uh, insertion of NG tube. So there are two beds, double beds and single beds that required this care. Um, the nurse goes to the medication room, goes to the linen cart, <clears throat> then goes to the clean uh, utility room and drops uh, and goes to the single bed, does the care uh, business and whatnot, comes back to the di dirty utility room and come back to the nursing station to check on the next task. And that's how one task is sort of performed uh, in our simulation model. If you notice that there were two circles that were spinning, the green and the red one, the red one illustrated a higher priority task, even though uh, the double bed was closer. So we had to sort of, we came up with that through, through, uh, during our focus groups. So anywho, we are quantifying nurse workload um, and career quality. For nurse workload, we're quantifying the total distance a nurse has to walk throughout a shift. In addition to that, we also quantify the nurse's movement, which is basically how many times they have to go to the patient room, how many times they have to go to the linen closet, and uh, and and other places. We also quantify their care time uh, in injuring lingo. Um, that's value added time, care uh, uh, time that's spent while delivering actual care minus documentation and whatnot. Um, we also quantify mental workload. The way we are uh, quantifying mental workload is, is that we are using, um, uh, we're conceptualizing this using a task, uh, task queue, which looks a lot like this, right? So this is a queue, the first task comes in, let's say that is the admissions task. The next task comes in, that's the medication one, the one that comes in after, that's a hygiene task, and so on and so forth. So the nurse, what and what the nurse does is, is that they knock off the first task and move on to the next one and the next one. So that's how essentially we're quantifying um, uh, nurse workload for that matter. Oops, let me just try to erase this. All right. <clears throat> All right, in addition to that, we're also quantifying uh, uh, care task waiting time, which is the total time a care task had to wait in, inside that queue. 
Um, we also quantify missed care. It's not exactly missed, but it's uh, it's care that was not delivered before the end of the shift. And the nursing literature actually uh, refers this to as missed care, so we were we we're using this term. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, what what happens? Well, there are two scenarios. What happens? Number one, uh, at the end of the 12 hour shift, the nurse, present nurse goes home and the next nurse has to sort of pick up that slack. Or sometimes the present nurse has to stay back and work overtime for, uh, to deliver those set missed care tasks per se. So that's uh, missed care delivery time. And of course, we're also quantifying person division of missed care. Like um, are all of them high priority tasks or uh, some of them lower priority tasks like documentation? All right, uh, so once we created the model, we went in and we wanted to validate our model. Uh, we recruited our, the same unit and uh, we recruited 10 nurses from that unit, asked them to wear a step counter for about a 12 hour, for, for, for the total 12 hour shift. And uh, we quantified the total steps, the total uh, distance that they walk. And then uh, we programmed the same uh, bed assignment in our simulation model, and we did a comparison just to check uh, if uh, if you're getting uh, the same answer or not. One of the uh, aha moments that we sort of saw was that nurses were walking upwards of 11 kilometers per shift, and um, we, we most of us imagine that no nurses are probably walking like two kilometers because the unit is so small. Um, but no, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, the nurses are walking so, so, so much. Uh, just to sort of compare this value to the other, other industries, my brother works in the aviation manufacturing center, uh, sector, and he walks uh, close to 12 kilometers or sometimes more, and the facilities are really, really big. They're hangars. But here we have nurses who are walking in, in such a small area for so much, and it's, quite, it's going upwards of 12 kilometers. Anywho, um, our modeling uh, outcome uh, reported the same, um, uh, same, almost the same distance as well. Remember the focus groups that we did? We developed two task priority logics, so we tested both of them. Um, we calculated the inner class correlation and saw 97 uh, percent uh, consistency, which uh, validated our indicator. We also uh, did a job shadowing study in which we uh, stopped nurses around for uh, for about three, four hours. And uh, we saw that, of course, that nurses are walking, uh, sorry, visiting patient rooms up, upwards of 80 times um, and some of the other uh, other places. And yeah, we were seeing a consistency of 99%. So that further validated our study. So anywho, when our simulation model was, uh, was validated, we thought that, okay, let's test it out uh, in two scenarios. Uh, the first scenario was uh, testing it out on a 12 hour shift without breaks, and the other one was with breaks. So this is what we actually saw. So what we were what we saw was that these were the different care tasks that the nurse uh, that the nurses uh, provided in a 12 hour shift. Um, in addition to that, one of the things that we saw was that nurses are doing upwards of four and a half, 14 and a half hours of work in a 12 hour shift because uh, all of this bread boxes constitute missed care delivery time. Um, <clears throat> so, and of course this is pre pandemic. Um, so this provides us insight that yes, nurses were overworked even before um, the pandemic. We also tested our simulation model on two um, technical design parameters. Uh, we changed nurse patient ratios, which is basically over here all the way from um, uh, two patients um, uh, up and upwards to uh, upwards to six patients, for that matter. We also tested uh, uh, the, the impact of patient acuity level, which is basically the sickness level for patients. We had a baseline case, and then we did a negative 10% increase and upwards of 30% increase. Um, so if we see that uh, for the most extreme condition, which is one nurse assigned to six patients, we're seeing that nurses are spending. Uh, 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 nursing are, our nurses are obviously overworked and upwards of close to 80 care, care tasks are missed. But that's the most extreme condition. The most optimal condition in most places is one nurse assigned to five patients. Even then, we're seeing upwards of 50, uh, 50 care tasks that are missed towards the end of the shift. All right. 
So anywho, um, once we uh, sort of tested these two experiments, we thought that, okay, um, what else can we add in our simulation model? We didn't have biomechanical load. Uh, biomechanical loading was, was missing. Uh, we had the care task sequences, but we didn't have the load amplitude. All right. So if you were able to incorporate the load amplitude, we'll be able to quantify peak and cumulative uh, biomechanical load. And we thought that maybe let's we can achieve this using uh, DHM. So we did a video recording study using the method of Norman uh, uh, Norman Dahl from back in 1998. Uh, we recruited a nurse for about eight hours, and we used uh, two cameras, one over here and one over here, uh, to <clears throat> sort of gain an understanding of the different uh, care task postures that a nurse ha would have while they're doing uh, delivery care. So this is uh, what it kind of looked like. We did the video recording study, got the care task postures, used a force gauge uh, mechanism uh, to quantify the hand forces, modeled this on a software by the name of 40 Watt back that I'm sure people have heard of, and we were able to quantify uh, the physical workload for all the care tasks um, in the realm of nursing. Um, I know I, I, I kind of summed up like uh, five months of work in like five, uh, in like, uh, I don't know, 30 seconds, but, but yeah, uh, we were able to quantify uh, physical workload for all the care tasks uh, for that matter. So the way that we integrated biomechanics into DES was that the physical workload that we got from our, um, uh, from our uh, from our DHM study, we were able to incorporate that and uh, we quantified uh, we were able to quantify the physical workload, which was peak and cumulative lumbar uh, compression and moment. So this is what the time trace kind of uh, uh, what we got. Uh, that by the way, we're looking at lumbar moment over here, and uh, from 8 a.m. to uh, Let's say, I don't know, uh, 10 a.m., these were the care tasks that were performed. Uh, the top, at the action level, these were the top three uh, care tasks that were, that were really, really um, bio, uh, heavy in terms of biomechanics. The first one was up in the chair, which meant lifting the patient from, uh, from, uh, from the bed and putting them um, on the chair. That was about three uh, thirty five, a little bit above uh, thirty six hundred newtons, and then the ambulation care task uh, action. My apologies, and then we had the um, uh, the uh, lift the patient head with one hand and wash the patient's forehead with the other hand. Um, so if we compare uh, if we compare these values from the NIOSH action limit, both of them are increasing over here and here. So this further proves why nurses do get injured all the time, because they're being exposed to care tasks that go beyond the action limit. We also had one uh, one uh, care task that actually was really, really near the NIOSH maximum permissible limit. It didn't increase that, it didn't go beyond that, but it was really, really near that. So that further provides insight that yes, nursing uh, nurses uh, do have a increased proportion of getting injured. Um, we also quantified peak uh, shoulder moment, and um, these are the shoulder moments for, for all the different, uh, different care tasks that, uh, the, the, that we saw. And uh, as you could see, uh, some of these care task moments go beyond, um, uh, go beyond the reported pain levels for light automotive assembly workers reported by our colleague Seaman um, back in 2010. Right, and yeah, of course, so coming back over here as well, like, yes, yeah, some of that care task actions actually uh, was consistent with the works that Holmes did back in 2010 as well. So, anywho, life was okay up till this point, uh, things were going good, then all of a sudden, COVID happened, and the world got flipped upside down, and uh, uh, newer challenges emer emerged in healthcare. Uh, 71 percent of the nurses were at uh, at breaking point, a lot of uh, nurses uh, and healthcare professionals were, had su suicidal ideation, um, and a lot of healthcare professionals unfortunately passed away. Uh, the nursing profession is deteriorating as we speak, and the International Council of Nurses uh, 
uh, says that we need about 13 million nurses to fill this void in the upcoming um, in the upcoming years. And all of this is driven by the excess workload, which seems to be a problem. So our modeling experiment, and we were thought, okay, what can we do about it? So we thought that this uh, discrete event simulation methodology that we kind of uh, came up with, um, uh, human factors enabled through the discrete event simulation approach, um, let's, let's use this to quantify workload uh, in COVID-19 uh, scenarios. So our modeling experiment was that one nurse assigned to a combination of COVID positive patients and COVID negative patients, right? Uh, with a nurse patient ratio of one to five, which is a standard in most units, right? Um, so time now for model upgrade, right? Just like cell phone upgrades. So we had to upgrade the model to match the pandemic settings. And um, these were the three things that we had to upgrade and we did this via multiple focus groups um, and we quantified um, the walking patterns, changes in walking patterns, uh, care delivery logic, and of course the added, the added uh, care task, uh, indirect care task, which is the IPAC routine, which stands for infection prevention and control routines, which is essentially donning and doffing PPE. Um, so we upgraded that um, in addition to that, uh, now we can we have the mechanism to quantify the total time nurses spend uh, donning and doffing, and of course the biomechanical workload as well, uh, cumulative lumbar and uh, lumbar load and um, shoulder moment. So in the realm, uh, so let's dive uh, down into the results side of things again for COVID. So this graph represents the time utilization for nurses um, under a variety of settings and uh, in COVID-19. Uh, we are testing the number of COVID positive patients assigned. Um, the nurse patient ratio was always one to five. Um, we have the pre-pandemic condition and in this one COVID positive patient and that means four COVID negative patients, two COVID positive patients, that means three and two and one and zero and so on. So anywho, what we, what we saw was that nurses spend lesser and lesser time delivering direct care. So out of that 12-hour shift, where is that excess time going? They're spending majority of their time now, I won't say majority, but a major chunk of their time uh, in um, uh, donning and doffing PPE, which is I IPAC uh, routines. Um, and as we can see that since care demands are increasing, and now this new added policy of donning and doffing PPE anytime you enter the patient room and exit the patient room. So that is, uh, uh, that is adding up. So when you're spending more time uh, on, uh, uh, more time on donning and doffing PPE, direct care time takes a, takes a back seat, unfortunately. And that's actually one of the reasons why um, we can see that nurses are just trying to rush, trying to deliver care as fast as they can. Uh, but in doing so, they have to sort of do don and off PPE. Um, and uh, when we spoke to some of the nurses, they also said uh, that yeah, just to deliver the care, sometimes we we don't we don't really properly tie our gowns, and um, I mean they try to cut corners, but they can't just to deliver the uh, deliver the care. Um, so um, nurses are now spending for the most extreme condition for five COVID positive patients. Nurses are spending upwards of six hours out of a 12 hour shift donning and doffing PPE. Uh, but uh, that's the most extreme condition. Uh, let's be realistic here. The most common condition is three COVID positive patients in the unit that we were working. But still the nurses were there also were, uh, still they were donning and doffing for close to four hours cumulative um, in a 12 hour shift. And they were donning and doffing clothes were upwards of what, 65 or 70 times in the shift. So what is the implication on MSD risk and uh, lumbar load for that matter? So the unique insight that we found was that lumbar load is actually decreasing. But why is that? Well, the reason is the, the care tasks for nursing are just so heavy in terms of biomechanical load. But on the other hand, Tasks such as IPAC routines, they they don't have uh, they're not <clears throat> excuse me, 
uh, they're not as uh, heavy uh, in terms of biomechanical load um, if, we, if we can sort of see over here. This is the average lumbar compression uh, for, uh, let me use my annotation here, for direct care work and for IPAC routine. So you can actually see um, how big this bar is for direct care work and how small the bar can be for IPAC routines. So, of course, if you're now doing more, if you're now spending more times, uh, uh, more time um, doing uh, donning and doffing PPE, uh, which is less in terms of uh, the compression load, then obviously your, your, your cumulative workload will sort of come down. And this is something that we saw um, in, in this condition as well. Um, but having said that, if you if you do look at the pre-pandemic conditions and the the one COVID positive pa uh, patient condition as well, um, the cumulative biomechanical load was actually uh, going a little bit above um, the automotive assembly workers uh, that had low back pain, as reported by Norman and all back in 1998. But one thing to note is is that. <clears throat> Nurses are working for 12 hours and uh, the automotive workers were working for eight hours. But still, uh, it's worth acknowledging that yes, they are being exposed to such high amounts of um, low back pain and compression load. <clears throat> All right, um, we're seeing the same mechanism over here as well for a cumulative shoulder or shoulder moment because the IPAC routines are have a much less moment. Um, and uh, the other care tasks, such as lifting patients or uh, doing a hygiene related tasks, have a higher uh, moment. So, of course, uh, as we see that the nurses were assigned to more COVID positive patients, the biomechanical load and moment kind of came down. So, there are other several important factors that we are uh, quantifying beyond the biomechanical results that we the, that we just presented here and these can affect the MSD risk of nurses in pandemic scenarios firstly the observed increases in mental workload as you can see here indicate a substantial increase in job demands as nurses are forced to track and struggle to keep up with an ever increasing list of undelivered care tasks All right. um, so psychological demands are a key dimension of the demand control model, <clears throat> as we could see in this uh, figure um, of the CARE-6 model, uh, that especially when associated with low job control, which the nurses have, um, uh, they're, they're brought into multiple health problems, as we could see over here, right? So the impact that the psychosocial aspects have on healthcare staff illnesses, in this case, nurse, uh, nurses, um, and burnout should, should not be uh, underestimated. And workload quantification tools, uh, such as the one that we developed here, can be applied uh, to manage and control workloads by providing quanti uh, quantitative evidence um, and estimates uh, of workload under a variety of conditions. <clears throat> anyway, so I was trying to wrap this up so we can spend some more time uh, talking um, uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, in our Q and A session. So our MSD risk implications are: first of all, the peak biomechanical load does not change; it's, it stays about the same. Uh, it's the cumulative biomechanical load that actually is decreases. <laughs> Uh, why? Because of the influx of the IPAC routines. The peak biomechanical load will always uh, kind of stay the same. Um, uh, our psych psychosocial load is increasing because nurses are now spending upwards of six hours donning and doffing PPE, uh, which is contributing to increased workload because now they're not spending enough time on direct care. They're not able to do direct, enough direct care uh, tasks. They're, uh, every time they have to go inside a patient room, they have to don and off PP. Um, and of course, uh, as they're exiting, they got to doff uh, PP as well. Uh, <clears throat> so it is increasing mental workload. Um, uh, there are definitely limited measures to quantify workload proactively, 
there are several studies, but uh, but they're but they're very limited in terms of using uh, simulation technologies for that matter. So uh, this simulation model that we created uh, has the capability to sort of help us understand the drivers of workload and care quality in in healthcare systems by letting us um, test a variety of technical design and operational policies. So workload is determined by patient assignment, obviously, and because workload impacts care quality, this is the reason why care quality is also dipping. And this is one of the and and because workload is, is increasing, the nurse, nursing population sort of have, have had enough. They, they just can't keep up, cope up with it. Um, there are some studies that are coming in uh, that have reported that um, nurses that just graduated and now they're starting their professional life. Uh, after working a few days, they're like, nope, we can't, this is too much. This is not what we signed up for. Um, <clears throat> so yes, we need to do definitely do something about workload. And the beauty of these proactive simulation models is that we can test newer policies before they get implemented. Uh, at the end of the day, like uh, simulation tools help uh, avoid this magical thinking that when a new policy comes in and uh, the nurses or wh whoever the healthcare professional is are just asked to like, hey, just just cope up, All right? Uh, but when we have the simulation tool, we can actually quantify that, okay, if you add this policy, it's gonna take this much minutes and it's gonna impact care quality. So um, we're not saying that we just solve the workload problem. What we're saying is this is a tool that can help address the workload um, that the workload problem, which seems to be a driver uh, for nurse turnover in the healthcare industry. Hmm. Anywho, uh, coming back to the COVID-19 scenario as well, when the nurses are assigned to more COVID positive patients, um, miscare is increasing. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, waiting time is also increasing because, you know, more tasks keep getting added up. Um, <clears throat> We did present our, our research to the healthcare leaders and they do see the value in, in our work. And um, uh, some of them uh, were baffled like, oh, this is, these are the implication, uh, implications of uh, adding new newer care tasks. And when we showed these to uh, nurses, they also kind of agreed that, yeah, this is what we were seeing in, in, uh, in actual. So some of the model users, right? Who can use this model? Well, policymakers, of course, to test newer policies uh, proactively. Hospital managers, um, um, hospital managers as well, uh, when they're coming up with unit-specific policies, charge nurses to come up with the most ideal uh, patient bed assignment, uh, geographical patient bed assignments. So our model has the capability that, okay, remember that unit layout that I kind of showed you at the start? Uh, um, they can use uh, they can use kind of like these simulation technologies to sort of compute that okay what happens if I sort of assign uh, let's say Veronica uh, or let's say Mandeep to um, uh, to patients uh, patient beds assigned by the extreme end or at the closer end. Um, in addition to that, uh, this modeling approach can help architects too, and 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 better designing inpatient unit uh, layouts, layouts that can assist the healthcare workers. Um, and of course, our ergonomist uh, as well, to test, uh, um, to test and quantify um, the, uh, the postures for care task deliveries and, and some of the other equipment that kind of goes along with this. Um, I know newer equipment. Anytime I uh, I open a open YouTube or LinkedIn, I see a new type of patient lift device. Um, <clears throat> it's cool, but the problem is it takes ten minutes to set up. So even though that device might be great, but unfortunately in practice, uh, nurses tend to avoid using that because if they have to set up the device and it takes ten minutes and they have to do that ten minutes and ten times in a shift. So that's, there you go. That's almost like two hours down the drain uh, per se. So simulation models like this can sort of get, uh, uh, can, can help you get a good understanding at the micro level as well. Um, so uh, just wrapping up now, um, um, we what's coming down the pipeline? Well, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Gregg is currently working on adding a fatigue tracking capability for intershift and intershift. 
So hopefully in the next couple of moons, we will we'll be able to sort of show uh, uh, share that to share that uh, uh, upgrade as well with you. We are currently testing um, emergency department uh, in uh, downtown hospitals as well, and there and the addition influx of COVID nineteen patients as well. Um, in addition to that, um, um, uh, Raymond Tran is also working in uh, the uh, CCC uh, units as well. Eventually, we would like to do economic analysis as well. Um, so yeah, these are some of the next steps. If you like uh, some of the stuff that we, uh, that we that I talked about, if you like some of the stuff uh, that uh, that our lab does, and if you want to be part of it, there is a grad student opportunity. Uh, so maybe you can reach out to uh, Patrick um, at the after the presentation, or maybe you can call him at the, at the end of the presentation to sort of ask more about it. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, uh, we want to acknowledge our, our funding partners, uh, Cree MSD, who has been uh, who's provided our support for this extension for biomechanics, and CERC for the initial creation of modeling stuff, and CIHR for the modeling upgrade for the COVID nineteen patient scenario. Anywho, uh, that is the end of the presentation, and I really welcome any questions. We would love to uh, sort of address them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sadim. Really appreciate that thought provoking presentation. I'll kick off the Q and a with this question. Um, going back to the focus group where you got uh, your information. Um, you mentioned that you went back to leaders. Uh -huh. were, were they the same individuals as in your focus group? And if not, did you go back to your focus group participants uh, to get their reaction to your findings? Um, all right, that's a good question. Um, I'll answer this question in, uh, I guess, in three points. Uh, the first one was in the focus groups, no. The focus groups uh, uh, participants were only nurses because this is a nursing care model. So we wanted to create a model that was, uh, uh, that. That was modeling sort of the brain of the nurse uh, uh, rather than um, <clears throat> the policies that were basically coming in from uh, 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 from the top brass per se. So yeah, uh, the focus groups had nurses. Um, so yeah, we didn't do that. Um, uh, but yes, we did showcase our results to the nursing. Uh, sorry, uh, the 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 healthcare leaders, um, and. Um, when we uh, we didn't get a chance to showcase our COVID-19 results uh, in, a, in, in a focus group manner, but we did share them with a couple of nurses and uh, their reaction was that yes, uh, uh, they weren't shocked at that the amount of time that they're spending in dotting and nothing. Thank you, thank you so much. So another question related to um, data came up and that was that staggering number of 30 million nurse shortage um, do is there any data uh, in your literature review or research um, analysis to to tell us where that came from? Uh, there was a report that was published by the International Council of Nurses, I think, back in 2021 uh, or end 2021, uh, where they uh, predicted uh, through some mechanism that 13 million. Uh, um, uh, 13 million nurse shortage uh, is now going to be there for the next while. Uh, so our that number doesn't come from our simulation model; it comes from the from the report directly. Okay, and and that uh, is a good segue into the next question. So this model is it something you created uh, for this particular research, or was it a pre-existing model? No, this, uh, we created the simulation model just for this research. Of course, the tool of discrete event simulation has existed for the past while, uh, but the programming and the creation uh, and the, uh, the, the logic that we created was all for this research uh, project. Okay. Can you tell us if this 4D WATBAK is publicly available? Um, I guess I'm going to bounce that question off to Bettina. <laughs> 40 while back does come from University of Waterloo, so uh, maybe they can address this uh, question. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, question, unfortunately, 40 watt back is no longer publicly available. Okay. 
I can add to that that if there's nothing special about the, you know, different different biomechanical models could be used to provide the inputs to the simulation. So it doesn't hinge on any one particular package. We use discrete event simulation as an environment, and there's uh, a number of commercial packages for that. And similarly, we're trying to use readily available models, or the the use of the model can be exchanged. Um, you know, for a different modeling scenario. So there's no there's no magic in which model or which tool we're using here. Thanks, Patrick. You you mentioned uh, in your presentation um, workload related to lift. Did you track the time it took to wait for additional staff? So when uh, two two individuals were required, say for heavier patients, um, it. This individual has commented that they've been advised that they could wait up to 45 minutes. That's a, a, a very good question. Um, the, when we were creating this model, we, we took the inputs from an anonymized patient care data software, which is from GRASP actually, uh, GRASP, uh, which most recently got bought by N4 systems. Uh, but the way that that software kind of works is that the nurse fills out um, the different care tasks that they did, and GRASP is a is a risk val is, is not a risk is a, is a validated um, as they say a validated tool that has standardized task durations with personal fatigue time delay. Um, so we essentially use the time that was there in the GRASP systems. But having said that, the model is very much adaptable. So if you want to take this unit, this simulation model to, let's say, the neuro ward, uh, where maybe the wait is, I don't know, uh, uh, per, uh, three hours, let's say. So yeah, we can adapt the model to that specification by just feeding in newer time durations and constructing a, um, a new focus group, uh, a new programming logic for the focus groups. Okay, thank you so much. Can you explain how, for example, an architect could use this research? Yeah, for sure. Uh, <clears throat> And you know what, let me just go back um, at the start. Um, all right, okay. Uh, oops. Uh, too fast. <laughs> all right, okay, let me turn on the annotation. All right, okay. So uh, the way that an architect may be able to use this uh, this type of research is that they can anytime run the simulation model, we have to run it on a, on a, on a virtual unit layout. So the virtual unit layout that we use was from the med surgical unit, the, the unit that we partnered up with. So if they want to, if, if they craft up a new unit layout, uh, which is something like maybe they have beds over here, all across, and maybe another nursing, uh, oops, another nursing station over here, kind of like a dual unit, then yeah, we can we can do that. Uh, the model is very much adaptable. All we have to do is just basically um map out this unit layout and upload it on our uh, discrete event simulation um, model that's it great so an architect in looking at designing long-term care homes retirement facilities or even our hospitals could apply this research in um, the design of certain floors facilities to maximize tasks Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, there's a lot of chatter these days going on that what is the ideal location for a nurse station? Should it be the center of the unit or should there be two nurse station, uh, uh, nurse stations in, in one, one in each corner? So, yes, the simulation can be used to sort of test that. And the beauty is, again, uh, <clears throat> what would be the implication in terms of nurse workload? And of course, quality of care. So if there's less walking, that means more time spent on direct care. And of course, if you if you're if you're doing long walks, like one of the things that we saw um, um, in our simulation study was that there were a couple of beds that were over here. So if the nurse always had to walk from over here, 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 and then go from till here, it was it it, it was frustrating at some point. So so yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, if patient care data is not available in the unit per se, can you suggest alternative measures? 
for getting that data? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, uh, we we w there are several units here in Canada as well. Example ER where uh, patient care data is not available. So the way the best way to do that is that first of all, uh, get a subject matter expert and ask them what are the different care tasks that are performed. You get that list and then you do a time and motion study. Yeah, uh, and uh, to sort of quantify that, okay, how many times task A is performed and how long does it take? Um, and uh, I think maybe do time motion studies for like about uh, 70 or maybe 80 hours. I think that's the standard in nursing uh, to sort of get a good, um, good widespread. One of the other things that um, this has raised is the um, uh, factor of fatigue as it relates to the tasks. So was there any implications related to the impact of fatigue and MSDs related to specific tasks? So if somebody is constantly doing lifting with a client uh, and they've had shorter shifts, poten uh, potentially less fatigue, uh, it, were you able to segment out anything related to fatigue and MSDs? So the next generation update that we're doing now with Dr. Michael Gregg is looking into fatigue. So in the present model, unfortunately, we haven't looked at fatigue, but we have looked at biomechanical workload and MSD risk. But yes, we are able to quantify and isolate uh, the impacts of um, heavy lifting tasks. So if there was a scenario <clears throat> where an individual was doing only lifting care tasks for the for like three hours straight. So we will be able to quantify that um, and quantify the implications in terms of um, in terms of MSD risk and of course, quality of care. Thank you so much. Why is activity the heaviest task in terms of biomechanical workload? Oh, I should have explained that a lot more. Activity care task group actually includes all the heavy lifting tasks. So an example, a couple of examples would be lifting the patient from the bed to the chair. Uh, in fact, uh, you know what? Let me just show you over here. Um, where'd it go? Oh, yeah. So uh, the Appen chair uh, was, was a clear task that came in from the activity group. Or another example would be lifting um, uh, uh, or, or turning the patient per se, so basically heavy lifting tasks. So they just classified the grass report classifies all of that as activity. Okay. Um, another consideration relates to years of experience. So um, some research has indicated that nurses with a higher degree of experience or even personal support workers are able to manage um, somewhat better. Uh, potential for injury. Were you able to look at the impact of years of experience within your study? Uh, yeah, we, we were able to sort of look into that a little bit. The, in our initial model, we developed two care task priority logics. The way that the focus groups ended up uh, being arranged was that one of the focus groups were, were, were ones where there were highly experienced nurses, um, nurses that had more than five years, five to 22 years of experience. And then the other one, they only had nurses with like one to three years experience. So yes, uh, we were able to sort of test out the implications of uh, uh, physical workload, like let's say distance walk as, as we can see over here, um, where consistently uh, care task priority logic uh, two was always had more, um, always had more uh, distance walk, but on the other hand, care task priority logic one in most cases like here, here, and here had lesser distance. And the reason was that the these were, uh, these came up from experienced nurses who kind of knew how to better manage their, their task sequence. Wonderful, that that's uh, good news. Um, are you aware if these, mo if this model or similar models have been used in other occupations such as custodians or maintenance workers? And if not, what are your thoughts on using a model like this for these op occupations? Um, as far as I know, uh, no. The uh, uh, a human factors enabled 
type simulation has not been used for custodial staff and whatnot. But I think it will be a phenomenal uh, extension to this model, uh, this type of research. Um, and uh, having, um, having an individual or a, a worker focused simulation does provide us insight on, uh, on, on workload and, uh, and of course quality. And I think if we can extend that model, maybe even to sort of uh, take into account error rates, um, fatigue, because custodial staff do have to uh, do some heavy physical work. Um, so yeah, I think that would be a great extension to this to this research, and it is possible um, to sort of do that. Yeah. Thanks, Sadeem. Um, some of your results did not include nurse break time. If in fact they actually do get break time, what are the implications for that? Um, so the reasons why we uh, for some of the results, uh, we did include break times like for COVID nineteen, especially was. Because you know what, let me just go to the COVID nineteen results. Um, it was because when we spoke to uh, spoke to the nurses uh, during the COVID nineteen wave two, um, they were rarely taking breaks because uh, they just didn't have any time. They were just uh, they were working at a hundred percent. Like they were really really preoccupied, and they rarely got a chance to see uh, to sort of take a break. Uh, at least during the wave two that when we were doing this research. Uh, so we wanted to mo create a model that represented uh, the closest scenarios. Uh, so yeah, we, that's one of the reasons why for some of the raw results, we didn't uh, include break time, but for our initial work, the one that I was showing you before, yes, we did include break time, but, but the beauty is, is that if you're not including break time, then everything that we're reporting is underrepresented. And the thing is, all the results, all the outcomes are so just so uh, bad in terms of quality of care. Workloads are already so bad. So if we are underrepresenting uh, the workloads, so just you can just imagine that how much workload um, would be when we start to add breaks. Uh, an example of that is basically over here when nurses had like a tournament break. And you can see that they're all they're working close upwards to 13 hours. Sorry, not 13 hours, 14, 14 and a half. 14 hours. And and it's interesting because if potentially having a break helps to offset the accumulation of fatigue, you know, what's the impact then of not having that break? Um, I think there is definitely a trade-off here. Uh sorry. Uh uh yeah uh th there's definitely a trade off um if you do get breaks of course fatigue you would get a chance for fatigue recovery um but on the other hand the amount of care that gets missed would also in uh, increase so there is a trade off and i'm not saying that we should just take away breaks mm -hmm. of course we should definitely take uh, add breaks but at the same time maybe add more resources so that uh, nurses don't feel guilty when they're going to a break because, you know, when a nurse goes to a break, the other nurses have to cover for them. And you're not working with enemies there, you're working with your friends. So you do feel bad that, okay, uh, my BFF has to not cover like so much, so much more while I'm resting on a couch. Yeah. Very, very challenging. Sadeem and Patrick. I wanted to thank you on behalf of Cree MSD and all the participants today for this really thought provoking presentation and something that we will need to continue to look at how to mitigate all of these challenges that you've presented today. Um, thank you and encourage all of our participants to join us next Tuesday for a webinar on recipe for the prevention of MSD learnings from biomechanical responses in team lifting and sudden drops. And please note that we are having this webinar from 11 to 12 rather than from 12 to one. And we hope to see you all there. Thank you again so much for joining us and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, and thank you for having us. And uh, please feel free to reach us out if you want uh, if you want to have an extended conversation about this research and this research agenda. Thank you, and have a great rest of your day.